Wow, yeah. Hey, much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. How you guys doing today? Hope everybody's doing well. Thanks for uh, joining. You know, not the uh, usual time I, I go live, but um, whoever's here is here. So I hope you guys enjoy. Uh, found this interesting little article talking about this uh, site. And... um. There's not much on it other than this in this article and then, you know, some other people talking about it, trying to debunk stuff, you know, with their conjectures and opinions. But so we're going to read it ourselves. You're going to uh, get the whole context behind it, who the person is that wrote it, you know, his credentials, things like that. And we're going to show correlation and uh, past videos, too, that we've gone over uh, where they found almost the exact same thing uh, in Mexico. We're talking about these ancient buried cities, you know, underneath a lot of layers of uh, the strata, all right, stratification, the earth, you know, geology. <laughs> it can show you, you know, a lot of the times how old things can be, you know, without, you know, depending just on carbon dating test. Wow. Welcome. Welcome. Hopefully we get a lot more people. All right. So that's where we're going to go over a little bit. So we're going to also go over again uh, some previous videos. This is uh, one of them. If you haven't seen this one, Huelle Tlaco, archaeological site in Mexico. We're talking about over 250,000 year old settlement. Hmm. And they actually found an elephant, an ans the ancestor of the elephants, uh, sketched on this bone here or this uh, rock here. And... Um, you know, humans aren't supposed to know this uh, type of elephant because it's supposed to exist before humans even existed or even in America, you know, like, <laughs> so according to their chronology. All right, we're going to go over a uh, previous uh, video we've done on what they found in Mexico that influenced the Lemuria story was the uh, archaeological find by William Neven. You know, all this is forbidding archaeology. This image right here is some of the uh, artifacts found there. And of course, a lot of different phenotypes, again, in the stone. <laughs> All right. So if you haven't seen that, we're going to go over that a little bit again. Uh, of course, we just went over Quiquilco Pyramid the other day, right? It's under lava. You know, over 8,000 years old, possibly even older. That's the minimum because it's under the lava, which is old, older than 7,000 years old. All right, so, you know, geology versus radiocarbon. And, of course, we're talking about elephants in America. Yeah, the ancestors of elephants all over the America. They found all over the America. 
That's not an Asian animal. Actually, mammals and all that came out of here. We've gone over this information before. So again, we might go over it again uh, today. So thanks for uh, showing up. Thanks for being here. Pura Vida. We live, guys, so, you know, bear with me. <laughs> Just bear with me. We got this. Got it all under control. Yeah, so, again, we're going to start with uh, some uh, videos before we get to this article. Again, so we can have context. All right. It's on Earth in America. Yeah, we're not talking about monkey bones or ape man or ancestors of man like you know they look like monkeys or anything like that these are modern type human bones this is the video right here part 14 untold ancient american truth series i have make sure you guys check out that series if you haven't this is the guadalupe woman again oldest modern human we might be talking about the case of a miocene man We're talking about 25 million years ago miocene man huh could it be that old this human skeleton was actually housed at the British Museum for many, many years. They actually had it on display for many years, a long time ago. And, the, and then they put it in their basement to hide it. At the west end of the room is a fossil human skeleton embedded in limestone brought from Guadalupe. Historic records when this was found and brought to the British Museum. The British Museum actually had it displayed as an antediluvian or pre-flood person. The history of the collections contained in the natural history departments of the British Museum. Okay, this is from volume one, you guys, 1904. This is what I'm showing in this video. This here is the Department of Geology. So right here, as you guys can see, Charles Koenig. So Charles Koenig was taking care of it in the museum. He had already displayed a predilection for organic remains, having published an account of the fossil human skeleton from Guadalupe in the Philosophical Transactions for 1814. An illustrated work on some of the fossils in the British Museum under the title Iconis Fossilium, all right? This was there. It says here, 1813, a human skeleton in coral limestone from Guadeloupe, West Indies, captured on the taking of the island from the French by Sir Alexander Cochrane, RN, was presented by the Lords of the Almerty. The specimen was described by Mr. C. Koenig in Philosophical Transactions, all right, in 1814. This is the book right here, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London. Page 107, it says here on a fossil, human skeleton from Guadalupe by Charles Koenig. Okay. The human skeleton embedded in limestone lately brought from Guadalupe by Honorable Sir Alexander Cochrane. Right. So this was a big find, a huge thing. Make sure you guys check out the whole video. I got a lot of sources, a lot of good information. You guys can see the British Museum deliberately put it in their basement after uh, displaying it for many years as a pre-flood person. Another video, make sure you check out. All right, so that was the uh, Guadalupe woman I was uh, referencing. Again, we're going just over some previous stuff. Just so you know, we're not, we don't just got one little thing here and there. We've gone over so much information, a lot of uh, forbidding archaeology uh, in the Americas, especially because it doesn't fit their, you know, uh, manifest destiny, the conquest of discovery, all that. They pop over. You know, they were here for something else. Um, so check it out, Guadalupe woman. Uh, this is another video I'm going to go over. But is this one untold ancient American truth? Pleocene man in America, the Calavera skull. We did a good video on the Calavera skull from California. 
in this video we go over some previous information some sites that predate accepted you know historical dates for people in america uh for example that found humans lived in north america 130,000 years ago study claims in california because they're finding uh, mastodon bones with marks and stuff showing human presence many finds pushing back their clovis dates all right guys are going to learn about clovis clovis was a hijack they try to say it was only you know 12,000 years ago the oldest and this first uh clovis culture and that was you know debunked it has been debunked ever since we're talking about you know very old uh sites all over the americas we're talking about the case for the calavera skull this is uh no exception found in deposits that are very very old we're talking about pliocene from the pliocene time pliocene man in america that is a picture of it in black and white i actually found you know the real picture and i colorize it that's what it looked you know people who actually saw it and knows about these things they say yeah look it's just like the uh surrounding material it's so old you know it's fossilized literally fossilized and it's a human skull we're not talking about monkeys we're not talking about apes now whether these things are that old that's a whole different thing i'm just saying that if their techniques if their science is telling you if they're finding it in these weird places that it should be millions of years old then maybe the way they date things is wrong and how they view the past what if this is part of a cataclysm right and they got stuck under there that's a whole different story but what i'm trying to tell you is that they're finding things and we're talking about modern humans here in america older than the monkeys they're finding in africa and this is stuff that's was hidden this is official uh finds we're talking about that geological survey of california mr jd whitney state geologist went over there we're talking about paleontology volume two and we're talking about that they found in the Pliocene uh, bed with human skull near Angels Camp, Calaveras County. They found what? A human skull in the Pliocene strata. This is from the American Naturalist, volume 16 from 1882. We're just talking about the ancient man of Calaveras. All right, so again, make sure to catch the whole video. Guys, this is almost a four hour video. Okay, yeah. a lot of good information, a lot of research, people yep. uh, making it official. They yep. cannot deny this stuff. They just try to hide it. Again, this is part 16, Untold Ancient American Truth. Clearly seen men in America, but don't worry, I have the playlist uh, I created. It's called Forbidden Archaeology, which contains all these videos of early men in America. Next video I want you guys to check out, if you can, is this one, Lemuria in Mexico. With all right, so the Calavera skull from California, that's no doubt. It's uh, <laughs> They can't even lie. It's fossilized. Um, Anybody that sees it, you know, that studies that stuff knows it's fossilized. It's not a fake. They found it officially, you know, in layers where it's supposed to be millions of years old, all that stuff. So just like the Guadalupe uh, woman. So it's not making sense, you know, according to the history they teach us. Um, we're also going to actually get into these videos there. This one I'm showing right here, the Lemuria, uh, the William Nevins uh, find here in Mexico, which was very uh, deep layers down below very old yeah very old as well william Nevins lost discovery At least 50, we're talking about they found things fifty thousand years old civilization and monagas nakal yeah william neven he knew james churchward he's the guy who created the story of lemuria he actually stole all his finds uh william neven's finds here in mexico they found this deep down in the ground very very deep where they found this stuff it's supposed to be at least fifty thousand years old so this is what we're telling you things don't add up things don't make sense and if things don't make sense then their whole stories are all false the ones they tell us about all the other stuff they're finding in other parts of the world so who's to say we're not old again make sure to check that out facts we go into part 17 untold ancient american truth this is calico early man all right calico all right, so check out this video as well, part 17, Untold Ancient Truth, the Calico Man, very good video. All this, you know, nobody really can dispute the sources, really, you know. All right, humans in America 200,000 years ago. You guys got to see the research behind all of this stuff. All right, we're reading, a, this is part of a book we're reading here. 
It says estimated ages range from 20,000 years for the surface artifacts to 50,000 for the buried relics. But as two master pits attained depths of well over 30 feet in artifacts, continue to be found surprise was succeeded by bewilderment dr thomas clemens retired chairman of the geology department of the university of southern california and project geologist believes 100,000 years is the maximum age of the site more than 100 scientists from all parts of the world attended the calico international conference at the san bernardino county museum in bloomington california in october of 1970 where they listened to lectures and examined the evidence the astonishing depth at which artifacts have been found, plus nature of the soil, has led some geologists to believe that 200,000 to 500,000 years is a more probable estimate. All right? So it's not making sense. The geologists, based on their science, are getting different dates than the archaeologists that want to accept. And so it's an ongoing debate. But many, many scientists, this is stuff that you never was told. And of course, I'm going to show you guys what happens. A lot of the times when they're finding these things, they're also finding monkey bones in Africa and drawing your attention. Yep. Another video I want you guys to check out, Early Men in America, Out of Place Bones, Geological and Archaeological Evidence, Forbidden History. Another video that touches on Early Men in America, many, many references we go over, The Bones of Forgotten Men, <laughs> as you see here. So yeah, we go over a lot of information on this, uh, only 38 minutes, make sure to check this out again. To correlate with what we're going to be learning uh, today about this site in mexico okay. all right so uh <laughs> so i'm showing i'm talking as as many cootie mails going on right now guys we're in the, we're in the cootie mail verse right now okay just bear with me <laughs> so yeah we, we're going to start a video that i said we're going to go over today uh the wedge wedge site this is an amazing site you know, this is really like not talked about because, you know, they really can't really debunk it or say anything other than just try to, you know, throw it off and say, well, it's impossible, you know. But um, we're going to go over real quick in this video uh, that I'm talking right now uh, before we get to uh, the new article. You guys enjoy. All right, guys. So we're going to be talking today about the Huellat Tlaco archaeological site in Mexico. And as it says here, uncovers 250,000 year old settlement. Now I'm just showing this blog real quick because it has some pretty cool pictures. But we're gonna go through a lot of material. So make sure to watch the whole video completely. Because here humans were hunting mastodons in Mexico 250,000 years ago. That sounds just like what they found in California talking about 130,000 years ago. This archeological heresy is supported by finding at Huelle Tlaco. Huelle Tlaco is an archaeological site in Valse Quillo, Mexico. Several potential pre-Clovis localities were found in the 1960s around the edge of the Valse Quillo Reservoir in Mexico. One of these localities is the site of Huelle Tlaco. This site was excavated by Cynthia Urban Williams, all right, and she has a lot of credentials sent over there. And this was Virginia C. McIntyre. She writes, Huelle Tlaco is a dangerous site. To even publicly mention a geological evidence for its great age is to jeopardize one's professional career. Three of us geologists can testify to that. Its very existence is blasphemous because it questions a basic dogma of Darwinism, the ruling philosophy or religion, if you will, of the Western scientific world for the past 150 years. That mm -hmm. dogma states that over a long period of time, members of the human family have generally become more and more intelligent. The Huella Tlaco site is thus impossible because mid Pleistocene humans weren't smart enough to do all that the evidence implies. All right, you see what they're saying? Oh no, they couldn't have, humans couldn't have done that in America. No, no. Besides, there is no new world anthropoid stock from which they could have evolved. All right, they're like, plus there wasn't people there, right? They're trying to say there was no people here. So, beds containing human artifacts at Valsequillo, Mexico, have been dated at approximately 250,000 years mm -hmm. before the present by fission track dating of volcanic material and uranium dating of camel pelvis. You all right, 250,000 years. All right. Hey, much love and respect to odd events. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Hope you guys, we're going to go over a lot of uh, information. Uh, just getting started. Let's go. I think this is just a website, right, guys? I know we're just in the beginning. But uh, as you guys can see, look at this column that's right here. Again, you can't even see this site right now because it's buried still. It's buried. It's it's not even above ground. It's it's old. 
Now there's a great article in the Quaternary Research from 1981, volume 16. And it's this one right here, as you guys can see from Cambridge University Press. I wasn't able to get access to this, but I want to show you guys that, you know, like I says here, this is from the USGS.gov, the US Geological Society, right? Or survey. Geologic evidence for age of deposits at Cuella Tlaco Archaeological Site, Valsequillo, Mexico, January 1, 1981. Direct tracing of beds during excavation in May 1973 confirmed that the artifact bearing layers of Cuella Tlaco underlie 10 meters of fine grained water lake deposits that constitute part of the widespread Valsequillo gravels. Dissection of these deposits by the adjacent reef Otoyac has reached a depth of 50 meters. The stratigraphic section at Ajitlaco includes four distinctive tephra units. The oldest one occupies a small channel and series of cut and filled streams deposits that have yielded bifacial tools. It lies more than a meter above flat line fine grain beds from which edge recharge tools have been recovered. The three other tephra units occur higher in the section. Fission tracks ages of Circon Fenocris from two of the younger tephra layers. 370,000, uh-huh, they're like, what? 200,000 and 600,000, what? 340,000 years, what? Agree with concordant uranium series dates for a camel pelvis that was found associated with bifacial tools at Huerta Taco. 245,000, huh? They're like, what? 40,000 years by 230, 180. This is still buried today. Or, you know, the internet even came around. Yeah, I was, I was following Graham Hancock for a while. I was reading a lot of his uh, <laughs> books back then. Um, he's actually talking about this in his website here. He has a blog here. It says the first American world right here. All right, guys, we're barely flopping. Thank you. Thank you. We live. All right. We're barely flopping right here. That's done by the U.S. Geological Survey. This is what I'm trying to explain. Our mm-hmm. elephant great mm-hmm. distinct languages Arthur, right? I read a lot of the city of Puebla, about 75 miles south of Mexico City. Juan Armenta So he's talking about a remarkable art piece discovered in 1959 by an equally remarkable man at the Valsequillo Reservoir outside the city of Puebla. All right, that's what uh, we're starting off right there. Macho stunned the world with his discovery of a mineralized elephant pelvis with engravings of elephants, big cats, and other extinct animals. All right, guys, so not only are they just finding artifacts here and evidence of man living here and these deposits that are supposed to be that old, right? They also found a pelvis, right? With drawings. A pelvis of one of those large elephants, a bone. Yeah, they drew on the bone. They put engravings of what? Elephants? So somebody, a person was drawing elephants, big cats. We're talking about the lions, the jaguars. We already know all these things originated here in America. Check out my ancient animals of america video we've proven this and other extinct animals now what is significant about this right we're talking about art right guys we're talking about people creating art drawing this is old this would be the oldest art a human has done that has been found the engravings had been made when the bone was still fresh still green whoever made these engravings actually saw those animals and probably even ate and prayed to them (laughs) <laughs> the most amazing creator of them all was smack dab in the middle of the thing. A fourth tusk gomphotere. What is that? Mm-hmm. You guys are going to see. An ancestor of the mastodon. So this is from our elephants in America video. This is one of the ancestors. I told you that the ancestors of the elephants were found throughout America. We're talking about elephants originating here too in America. And they found a drawing of a gun foot here. All right, so we're going to get a little bit of that video today. All right. In this Mastodon bone. So meaning the person saw that. This animal, as it says here, an extinct in U.S. for over a million years. It's supposed to have been extinct for over a million years. Yet a human drew it. A human who made an engraving on a Mastodon pelvis that was found in deposits that are supposed to be over 200,000 years old, based on the test done by the U.S. Geological Survey. This is what I'm trying to explain to you guys. I hope you guys are following so far. We're talking about drawings here. Look at this, guys. The oldest. 
This would be the oldest. But in central Mexico, these mythical beasts lived among mammoths and mastodons and humans. This was absolutely amazing. Other engraved pieces were also found. Nobody in the Americas had ever seen anything like this before. They were all mineralized. It was totally new in every meaning of the word, except for their age, which could be very old. Harvard archaeologist Cynthia Irvin Williams, all right? We're talking about a Harvard archaeologist. Even Cynthia, even though she don't agree with the other lady from the, because this is an archaeologist, right? She dated it to about 30,000 years, which predated all the Clovis uh, theories, right? Clovis first, talking about 12,000 years ago, Bering Strait. So even she agrees that it's much older than that. So that whole Bering Strait theory is debunked by Cynthia, Harvard archaeologist, and Juan Armenta Camacho. With direct support from Harvard and the Smithsonian, found another 80 to 90 mammoth and mastodon bone sites around the perimeter of the reservoir in 1962. Then they excavated three sites on the Tetela Peninsula, all had artifacts next to mineralized bones that were left behind after butchering. The sites themselves were laid out pretty much how the hunters left them. The features were covered by successive layers of sands and silts deposited by a very slow creek and were laid out in the same positions as they were originally buried. In the business of paleoarchaeology, it is called primary deposition. And in this respect, Valsequillo was pure gold. For example, Irvin Williams found a horse jaw. Remember that horses originated in America. Yes, all that originated here, not over there in Asia or Africa. And a tooth from it was an inch away from the jaw. This meant virtually no bone movement when they were buried. About half inch away was a stone knife. You guys hear that? There was a knife next to this. It was immaculate feature, so good that they sought it out in a square block. A portable feature destined for the National Museum. It was just priceless. For the people of Mexico, it meant national pride. The city of Puebla began celebrating as the Eden of the Americas. It was all there in that feature block. This feature block was later vandalized and destroyed by the Mexican archaeologists who signed the official dig permits. This was the same official who would later falsely testify that the artifacts were planted. This charge was laughably dispatched by Irvin Williams' 3,000 photographs detailing the excavation and extraction of each piece Uh also currently missing. Uh You guys hear that? The lady from Harvard said no. So they were trying to debunk the lady from Harvard and she had how many photographs? Look at that. 3,000 proven the excavation, which also all this stuff has disappeared, right, guys? Smithsonian, she worked for the Smithsonian. What she thought was going to happen? Welcome to a Dubai West. So this is a uh, picture of the area. All right. So, yeah, pretty uh, crazy stuff here. Hold on. Let me see, guys. Okay. Uh-huh. So that's on uh, this side. Uh, let me see. And Valsikiju and frustrations grew. Then, geological science entered the fray. In 1968, a USGS geologist suggested using his new uranium series technique to date the bone, and that's when everything fell apart. The bone dates from the Tetela sites were 250,000 years old, and so opened up one of the craziest archaeological wormholes in history. That's a quarter million years old. Modern man didn't live back then, and all the artifacts from Valsikiju were fancy spearheads and blades. Things we mods didn't know how to make until 30, 40,000 years ago. And there was art. And Valsikiju was 250,000 years old. That's Homo erectus time. And there's art. It Uh not only threatened to trash the American paradigm of prehistory, it would also trash the old world paradigm for the last phases of human evolution. All right? Debunking evolution. This was serious. There were modern stone tools in Mexico that were 200,000 years older Uh than the earliest modern tools in Europe and Asia and Africa. It was nuts. It was impossible anyway. You looked at it. Wow. Geologists kept coming up with similar ages for the site, no matter what they threw at it. And no matter what the geological sciences turned up, no matter all their tests that they were saying, no, we did numerous tests. The archaeological community fought back with 
stifling wall of absolute silence and non-comment. They would have none of it. Period. All right, so I don't know if you guys have noticed, but there is this like ongoing uh, beef or disagreement with archaeologists and geologists because of this. When they ever since they started coming with their carbon dating and all that, and um, you know, geologists, it's it's almost like they don't respect what geologists say. They're always going with the archaeologists are saying, and and, and the archaeologists are always trying to make America a lot younger than the so-called old world over there. Uh, while geologists are finding the stuff and the stratification they're finding it and and you know their science what they learn is telling them no man this this is old according to what we learned you know our science we got phds too you know so it's it's a little ongoing beef but um make sure to check out this whole video let me see what we got here all right clovis has been debunked the study of potential pre-clovis sites is not encouraged and those who report a possible pre-clovis site do so at significant risk to their career. So mm -hmm. you guys hear what happens? An important part of this book reviews what is known about early man site along the shores of Valsequillo Reservoir, south of Puebla in central Mexico. It is a fascinating tale with a lot of data which are accepted by most geologists and not accepted by most archaeologists. As a scientist, I am embarrassed that it has taken more than 30 years for archaeologists and geologists to revisit the bone and artifact deposits at Valsequillo Reservoir. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, data were presented that suggested early man had been in the New World much earlier than anyone had previously thought. Rather than further investigate the discoveries, which is what should have been done, they were buried under the sands of time. All right, you guys here? This is not a conspiracy. They literally did this in the hope that they would be forgotten. Mm -hmm. My idea of science is to investigate anomalous data and hopefully learn something new. Unfortunate, the Clovis first mentality was so ingrained in North American archaeology that no further work was undertaken. My first contact with the bone and artifact deposits of the Valsequillo Reservoir came in the early 1970s. When I was asked if I would date zircons from some tephra unit layers of volcanic Rumus Ash, all right? So you hear, he's a geologist. They asked him to go do the dating that overlay the artifact bearing beds. I agreed to take on the study as I was aware of the controversy regarding the age of the site. At the time, I was sharing an office with Barney Sabo, the geochemist who had provided the uranium series dates that started the controversy. His ages suggested that the artifact beds were in excess of 200,000 years old. This did not sit well with the archaeologists in charge of the project. Uh -uh. The original paper by Sabo, Maldi, and Irvin Williams, Earth and Planetary Science Letters from 1969, you guys can look for it, uh -huh. sets the stage for the controversy. Yep. Geochronology versus archaeology. This is the only paper of which I am aware where one co-author submits a rebuttal in the midst of an otherwise straightforward scientific paper. Additional data suggests an, an old age for the deposits came shortly after the Sabo paper. Virginia C. McIntyre, while studying the characteristics of the overlying tephra units, discovered two things that suggested an old age, although neither of the... Okay, so again, let me just show you guys what we're looking at. Oh, sorry. Here we go. So this is the video we're going over right now. Uh, so the widget type archaeological site. I actually go over a lot of sources. I want to have video. Um, make sure to check out the full video. All right. We're going to uh, move on. <laughs> I'm going to move on to uh, another video that I have because I want to show you different sites or different things that I've shown. Um, make sure to, again, I showed you the playlist already. Uh, it's called Forbidding Archaeology. These are all in there. Or you can just go to my series also, uh, Untold Ancient American Truth. All right. We're going to see you. Go to this one real quick. And let me just see. So we're gonna go all the way to one. Let me see. A bribe of five pesos, which is two. Two and a half dollars. So right now, in this moment, we're reading from uh, Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramids. Great book. 
we've read uh, before this. This is an hour and a half in, guys. So we're talking about another archaeological site in Mexico, I believe in the Guerrero Guerrero region. And um, yeah, he went down really low, like at least fifty meters or feet down. And um, you know, this is indicating at least fifty thousand years old. And they found some amazing things here. Um, he ended up meeting the guy, uh, James Churchward, uh, William Niven did, right? And James Churchward literally stole all his, like, archaeological work and created his whole story of Lemuria based on what William Niven had found in Mexico. So he started adding his conjectures when he wrote, you know, about the Nagas and coming from Lemuria and this mysterious place. But the Nagas were Maya. They were from here. We went from here. We went to... Hindustan Bharat, you know, but yeah, Niven, uh, William Niven, N I V E N, I believe. So we're going to go over some of the information here. At that time, he managed to discover the actual spot between Texcoco and Hu Halue Pantala, hamlets just north of Mexico City. He became across, he came across hundreds, if not thousands, of pits dug into the sand, clay, and tepetate used for material by builders of Mexico City for more than 300 years, exploring these pits, which Neven says cover an area of about 10 by 20 miles in the northwest corner of the Valley of Mexico. He came across vast layers of what appeared to be very ancient ruins, whole prehistoric cities lying as deep as 30 feet below the plain, which appeared to have been overwhelmed by a series of cataclysmic tidal waves. Okay. All right, you hear what this, what's going on here? They found what he found. He found ruins buried 30 feet below the ground. Obvious something happened there, right? Cataclysm. All right. So, again, this is what we're looking at uh, right now. This is the video we're watching right now. In case you haven't seen it and you want to watch the whole video, this is what uh, the cover is. All right. perhaps at several thousand year intervals, which, as Neven described them, had left telltale strata of boulders, sand, and pebbles by their depth beneath the surface. Neven estimated the oldest remains might go as far back as 50,000 years. All right? Now remember, in the past videos and the other parts of this series, we got Graham Hancock telling us they've been hiding 100,000 years of history here in America. There's proof of 100,000 years of occupation in the Amazon, all right? So what are we, you know, what's going on here, right? What are we really finding out? This is the true old world, right? We get everything that they've hidden from us. Four to six feet below the first pavement, even says he encountered a second concrete floor, but in the intervening space, failed to find a single piece of pottery or other trace to indicate that humans had once lived here. Beneath the second pavement, he describes coming upon what he considered the great find of many, many years' work in Mexican archaeology. Neven discerned beneath a well-defined layer of ashes from two to three feet thick, analyzed as being of volcanic origin, traces of innumerable buildings, large but regular in size, the remains of a vast city which appeared uniformly at the same level throughout more than a hundred clay pits, in one of the houses, most of which were crushed and ruined, filled with ashes and debris, he says he found an arched wooden door, which had turned to stone. The walls of his of this house were bound together with, with white cement, harder than stone itself. In one uncrushed room, about 30 feet square, full of volcanic ash, with a flat roof of concrete and stone, even says he came across many artifacts and human bones which crumbled to the touch like a slaked lime. According to his detailed report, a complete goldsmith's outfit was still on the floor with some 200 models of figures and idols modeled in clay turned to stone, each model thickly coated with iron oxide, bright and yellow, presumably there to prevent the molten metals adhering to the patterns while in the casting pot. Neven says the ornaments were unlike any found in Palenque or Mitla or anywhere between. The work was fine, beautifully polished, demonstrating an advanced degree of civilization. On the walls, Neven found paintings in red, blue, yellow, green, and black, 
which he says compared favorably with the best he had seen from Greek, Etruscan, or Egyptian works of a similar sort. The ground color of the wall was a pale blue, six inches down from the 14-foot ceiling. A frieze painted in dark red and black ran around, around the room, glazed with some native wax, which had perfectly preserved the color and pattern, which depicted the life of some person, apparently a shepherd from birth to death. Continuing the book, it says, then in 1921, it, we're still talking about William Neven and his uh, discovery there in Mexico. In the course of excavations at Santiago Ajuizotla, a hamlet contiguous to Amantla, about five miles northwest of Mexico City, Neven came across a discovery so startling, he says it opened up for him a whole new field of archaeological research. At a depth of 12 feet, Neven described coming across the first of a series of stone tablets with very unusual pictographs systematically exploring other clay pits and tepidate quarries within an area of 20 square miles. He claimed he was able to unearth during the course of the next two years, 975 more tablets. In the end, he says he found more than 2,600, though there was nothing in these tablets by which he could determine their exact or even approximate age, and even deduced from the depth of which they were buried and the accumulation of debris on top of them that they were over 12,000 years old and more likely closer to 50,000 years old. All right, I just want to show you. All right, so a lot of people's always like, Pakurimeo, Gobeki Tepe, Gobeki Tepe, or whatever in Turkey over there is old. But, you know, people are still stuck in, in the mind frame that, you know, Baron Strait and Clovis and things here ain't that old. But this is older than that, way older the layers where they're finding this. See, they don't do that when they find things over there. They're like, oh yeah, this is this old, unless it doesn't go with their time frames of where people are supposed to be. Go blacky tepe, yeah, that one. So, yeah, you know, even Graham Hancock, he was all into that, you know, in his previous books until now. Now he knows America before. That was his latest writing, uh, or you know, and that studied, you know, the anthropology and the history of anything like that, you know, and, he 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 convinced you know it was all coming out of here. You know when you actually do the research and you start seeing all this stuff got buried, like all these tablets were real. This was a real archaeological dig. This was recorded. I go over all the information in this video. Again, this is almost a two-hour video, an hour and fifty minutes. We just go going over some of the information in it. Uh, you know, go verify the sources. Go look it up the story. It's it's all real. It's all real. Where are these tablets? How come they never showed us this stuff? You know, and again. You know, you got to dodge the hijack with the gatekeepers and, and what you see in the history channel and all that, you know. You got to dodge the hijack big time. All right, this the picture of these tab uh, artifacts that he found, these tablets, all right. He found so many. It says, Neven showcase number six, containing a portion of his collection of carved stones from the Valley of Mexico. When William Neven died in August, uh, Austin, Texas in 1937, the New York Times described him as a distinguished mineralogist and archaeologist who had discovered buried prehistoric cities beneath the Valley of Mexico. He was also noted as the discoverer of four new minerals, including citralite, torogon, and nevenite. According to the Times, Neven donated to the Mexican government the best of the relics he found in Mexico, hmm. keeping for himself some which he sold to finance further archaeological expeditions with what was later with what was left over, there were enough pieces to establish in Mexico City a private museum of 30,000 exhibits. Mm. You hear this? How come we don't know about this? All right. All right. So I just wanted to go back to an illustration that was here in the book that I didn't show you guys. So I guess this is the, uh, the death of what he found, the ruins, the buried city. All right. So it tells you, I guess this will be the top, right? The land level. Then it says here one foot of earth. And then right here it says nine feet of boulders, gravel, sand, drogues, pottery. And then it says first pavement, six feet of small boulders, gravel, and sand. And then it says second pavement, right? And then it says 14 feet of small boulders, gravel, sand. Then right here it says volcanic ashes. And then it says buried city, the third pavement. Neven's Mexican buried cities, now 7,000 feet above level of sea. Mountains 5,000 feet higher intervening. In the several strata clearly revealed by the pits, Neven says he found traces of what he describes as three well-preserved concrete floors or pavements of, at depths from about 6 to 25 feet. 
Above the first pavement, there was a deposit of small boulders, pebbles and sands covered with a foot thick coating of rich valley soil. Everywhere in the first layer of debris, Niven found fragments of broken pottery, small clay figures, diorite beads, spears and arrowheads, spindle whorls, and other artifacts mostly broken. All right, so this is the death. You see how deep he found this? This was buried under a cataclysm. All right. All right, and we're back in the book. Just real All right, so that's uh, this video. Make sure to go ahead and uh, watch. So again, this was James Churchward's book right here, The Lost Continent of Moo. Again, he, he credits William in the book a little bit. He's, he acts like that's his partner, and, you know, they did this together, and he wants to thank William for helping him create the book, but he added so much conjecture. William never said anything about this coming from any Lemuria or, or Asia or anything like that. You know, that was all, this is, these are gatekeepers. And then they turn people into reptiles <laughs> when they're talking about your ancestors. I'm being serious, like, oh, yeah, those are the reptilians, the Nagas. No. <laughs> yeah. Dracon, yeah. Feather serpent. Very uh, fierce and violent person. Check out the definition of dragon. All right, let's see. We're going to go. Classic one to suspect in a mystery story, if there were anything to suspect him of. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the other day we did a video on the Quiquilco Pyramid. Again, just real quick, you know, this was underneath layers of lava, all right, part of the uh, pyramid. And again, this is in Mexico. So you guys are going to see, we're going to find this out soon. It's all going to be revealed. A few days after his workers began to excavate, an unidentified light was seen over the top of Quiquilco. It was a truncated cone with four steps, 387 feet in diameter, and stood 60 feet in height. The top step formed a circular platform, 290 feet in diameter. The name Quiquilco is an Indian name which signifies dancing, alluding perhaps to ancient religious rituals. Sides of the structure. Below the Pedregal lava was found an archeological stratum today classified as early classical 200 to 400 AD. Below this was a layer of volcanic ashes. Below that were the remains of an intermediate culture. Below that was another thick layer of volcanic ash. Below that were the artifacts of a very primitive culture. Below that was a solid pavement which surrounded the pyramid, which must be as old as the last construction period of the structure all right so again you you guys heard how many layers right all right so real quick what we're talking about uh, in case you missed that video uh is the quiquilco pyramid right here uh the bottom of the pyramid part of it was uh underneath uh layer actually there was many lay uh layers actually of, of different volcanic eruptions there was at least 18 feet before there was a uh, another layer it was so there was ash, and then there was eighteen feet low. There was there was another uh, layer of ash, and this is all under the Pedregal lava flow. So under many layers of eruptions, uh, as they're shown here in the uh, the drawing, as you guys can see, it's of a Pedregal lava flow. Then you got the early classical uh, period, the volcanic ash. There you go. Then you got an advanced culture. You got people living. Then you got volcanic ash under them. So something happened before them, and then after them. Then you got a very primitive culture. You got people, and then you got the pavement. Pavement. This is older than 8,000 years old. Below that, below that, and below that, and below that. All right, so here's the drawing. It says here, up to 18 inches of detritus on slopes and top of pyramid. And it says here, the pedregal lava flow. Up here, early classical. 
a period of volcanic ash on top. So there's another volcanic eruption. So we got Pedregal lava flow. Then we got a volcanic ash right here. Then we got an advanced culture before that living there. But before them was layers of volcanic ash. So it already had happened again, another eruption. Then you got a very primitive culture. And you even below that, you got pavement. So what does that tell you guys? So they're dating it to 4,000 BC. Remember, that was the oldest carbon dating they got, 4,161 BC, right? We have to trust that. So that would be like over, you know, 6,000 years ago, right? So there, that's their moderate. That's the most they gave it. Again, they got uh, so many different uh, carbon dating test results. One of them was like uh, 51 AD. So these people are like 5,000 years off. You know, they're not agreeing with their test. And again, carbon dating came about 1940s. And again, geologists already had written their reports, scholarly works. I've got, I went over it in this video, you know, letting you know, yeah, this is this old. We found it in this strata. The geologists are telling you. So again, nobody's respecting the word of the geologist. So what's the point of becoming a geologist? If the archaeologists are saying, no, I'm right. No, I'm right, and that's it. <laughs> Literally, that's what they do in, in the academic world, guys, if you didn't know. You know, but that could mean this could be way older. They don't know. That's why there's a question mark here. It says here, layers of lava and ash engulfing the Quiquilco Pyramid near Mexico City. The pyramid itself was constructed of unformed chunks of lava, not of the Pedregal, which was much later, of course, but of other lava which is found in the neighborhood. It was carefully laid with no filler. The sides of the pyramid forming a 45 degree angle. At the top, the thickness of this lava facing was 70 feet. It is obviously much thicker at the base. The interior was filled with earth. Later work by Cummins showed that the structure had been enlarged at least two times, each time a new facing being put on it from the pavement up. Cummins found 18 feet of sediment and ashes between the bottom of the Pedregal hmm. layer and the pavement surrounded the temple pyramid. He tried to estimate as well as he could how long it would have taken to accrete all these layers, all right, geology guys, science, and came up with a remarkable figure of 6,500 years minimum. Wow. This added to the 2,000 year age of the Pedregal means the pyramid would have existed 8,000 500 years ago or more body bag or more guys so that's what he found under the pedregal layer all right so this is what we're talking about here this is what they're hiding guys this is old i hope you guys realize this is not just myth this is not just speculation conspiracy these are geologists telling you based on the stratification it could have existed 8,500 years ago or more Though attracting a bit of notice at the time, archaeologists fell over themselves, ignoring a structure that would have required a fairly complex civilization in the Valley of Mexico several thousands of years before Samaria or archaic Egypt flourished. Okay, guys, before so-called Samaria, there is no Samaria. <laughs> Remember what I've been telling you about Sumerians or archaic Egypt. All right, and remember what we learned recently about the fake chronology of Egypt. And shout out to Paul Cook for, again, proving that's geopolymer. They built those structures over there with that theme park. It's not ancient and it's not megalithic. It's concrete. Yep. So, again, they've been ignoring that this side is older than all that over there. But there's more. All right, there's more. But make sure to check out the full video. That's about an hour and 20 minutes long. Quick quickle if you haven't checked it out. You know, if you're new to the channel, you know, make sure to take the time to, you know, go over the previous vi videos, presentations, a lot of good information. You won't regret it. Um, it's still relevant. You know, it'll be relevant for a long time. Even the ones that are like five, six years old, you know, work your way up, take the journey if you can. I'm just going over the information a little bit just so we can get to uh, what I found uh, recently in another article. So again, the widget Tlaco archaeological site in Mexico, over 250,000 years old. I mean, they can't even explain this. You know, they're like, wow, what is this? You know, William Neven's find over 50,000 years old site. They found all these uh, tablets, figurines, 
art, so many artifacts. We're talking about cities buried under there, guys. Cities buried. When it comes to Quiquilco, we we also read. We remember that th that was just this part that was sticking out because this pyramid sticks out. That's they knew if it's there. So they, you know, unearthed it. They re, uh, restored it. It was looked like a mound before. It's shaped just like a mound, and uh, so they restored it. And you know, they were able to dig out the rest. But what they're saying is that underneath that Pedrega lava that we saw, there's so much archaeology still left. So much stuff to be found still. All right. So yes, there was seems to have been, you know, it's obvious that there was, you know, eruptions, and we don't know if this was cat you know catastrophic you know what happened to the people that were there or they had left already the region but most likely you know affected them but that's all right here the hills have eyes yeah the hills have eyes all right so we're gonna get to that let's see what we got here all right let's go over here guys let's put on some music whoa my fault <laughs> my fault my fault Yeah, wow. Almost sounds like a uh, night rider, you know. <laughs> yeah, so um where we at right here? We're in uh near Paredon, a town in Coahuila, the Zaragoza, in Mexico. I think it's the state of Michoacan. But um yeah, why am I here? So the nearest town I guess is El Paredon, that's the reference. And there was an archaeological site near this ring right here. It is very ring, <laughs> very uh, peculiar looking ring like from the top. It almost looks like what they try to show us in North Africa with Atlantis. Um, yeah, but I'm not saying anything about it. You know, I'm just showing you guys. So we're in this area right here. Uh, and we're going to back up. You guys see the uh, how it looks like leftover. Yeah, like it was mud there or something. It's like a desert there, but it's green too at the same time. But you guys kind of see how it overflowed there. I'm going to back up. You see that? All that. All right. Look at that. Oh, that's the... The spinning ball is not on its right axis. But you guys get it. So you got uh, the four corner region right here. Right. It almost looks like... You see how this flows with mud? See how it kind of goes? Like something flowed down there. Covered all that. Yeah, it's a little... <laughs> the spinning ball is backwards, guys. Sorry. I don't even know how to turn this. Turn, man. <laughs> but that's where it was. All right. We're going to get into uh, this book here. It says The American Antiquarian and Oriental uh, Journal. Let me just go to the, the cover so you guys can see it. This is from uh, the November and December issue of 1908, volume 25, number 6. 
All right, the American Antiquarian and Oriental Journal, again, by Reverend Stephen D. Feet, PH editor, and assisted by all these people. A lot of, most of these people got credentials. This is seen as very scholarly, these journals. All right, this ain't a, a tabloid newspaper or anything like that. <laughs> let's go right here. And let's see what we got. All right, so we're in page uh, 395 of this uh, journal. All right. And it says here, elephant remains in Mexico. From the city of Mexico comes a statement bearing the signature of Dr. Nicolas Leon, archaeologist of the National Museum of Mexico. All right, the National Museum of Mexico. Nicolas de Leon, Dr. Nicolas, Dr. Nicolas, who has a lot of books actually, like this one, Studies on the, of the Archaeology of Michoacan by Dr. Nicolas Leon. All right, Dr. Nicolas Leon Calderon, Regional Museum of Michoacan. He actually founded a lot of. Uh, this is his uh, bibliography. This is his work right here in Spanish, all these uh, writings. So not only did he help out in, uh, with the archaeology, and stuff like that. He also uh, studied medicine and and there was a pioneer in medicine in Mexico. So a guy that's not about like creating fake stories. Like he was a director of many museums, uh, you know, so this is not like a conspiracy. Somebody's writing. Just want to make that clear. Uh, just for example, it says here, Dr. Nicholas Leon, some time ago, Colonel Garrison called my attention to the fact that little honor has been paid by the medical profession of North America to one of its most distinguished members. To be sure, Dr. Nicholas Leon is better known as an ethnologist, anthropologist, philologist, archaeologist, and historian than as a physician, but his contributions to science have been so extensive and he has shown so many of the marks of genius that we shall all be proud to esteem him as a member of our profession. Dr. Leon was born in December 6, 1859 at Quiroga in the state of Michoacan, Mexico. After graduating in medicine from the College of St. Nicholas, Morelia, in 1883, he became professor of pathology and obstetrics in, the institution, in that institution and at later intervals also taught Latin, botany, natural history, and anthropology. In 1894, assisted by the region of the College of St. Nicholas, Dr. Leon founded a museum of natural history in Morelia. In 1886, he founded one in Michoacan, and in 1891, one in Oaxaca. The Museum of Michoacan has been famous not only in Mexico, but throughout the world. In the course of building up its collections, Dr. Leon has come into friendly contact with most of the leaders in ethnologic research of Europe and America. In 1900, Dr. Leon joined the staff of the National Museum in the city of Mexico, where he is still active as head of the Department of Anthropology. He founded the Department of Mexican Ethnology and was the first in Mexico to give uh, instruction in the branch of science okay come on now so this ain't about nicholas leon my point is all right this is the guy who they're talking about who did the archaeological dig who found all this stuff who wrote and said what we're about to read all right so the reason i'm saying this is because when you do research on this there's like people with blogs <laughs> you know blogs internet blogs just oh it's uh it's a hoax you know, just like that, and that's it. So, from the city of Mexico comes a statement bearing the signature of Dr. Nicolas Leon, all right? Archaeologist of the National Museum of Mexico. Now we know who he is. The signature would justify the belief that proper investigation of the facts related have been made, all right? This guy ain't no joke. So, if he said it, it's basically what they're saying. If he said it, then you better believe it. <laughs> well, not believe it. You don't have to, but hey, he got a lot of weight, that guy. You know, he not nobody just trying to make a, a tabloid uh, uh, clout. He's not clout. He got the clout already. He don't need clout. This, all right. The, the one great fact is that an ancient city, all right, another city, which was located near the present town of Paredon, where I was just showing you guys, in the state of Coahuila, some 500 miles north of the city of Me Mexico, was suddenly destroyed in some past age by an overflow of water and mud. And that its remains are still existent on that spot. All right. The ruins are still there. Many massive walls have been found. 
but they are covered with a mass of deposited earth, 60 feet in thickness. Come on now, guys. Guys, listen. <laughs> 60 feet of earth over this the ruins. All right? So a geologist is going to give it a, 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 a real ancient time, a, a long time, and a very old age. If they go, they're going to be like, what do you mean <laughs> 60 feet in thickness? was deposited over these ruins. And mingled in this earth are human skeletons. Human skeletons. They're not supposed to be there, guys. Human, not bones, not monkey bones. We're not talking about Lucy. We're not talking about none of those monkey ape bones they find in over there in Africa. The people calling their ancestors. No, no disrespect, but you guys, if you believe in out of Africa theories, that's based on Darwinism. That's based on Darwinism. You believe in evolution. <laughs> when we got human bones here, I, t I showed you guys in the beginning of this presentation. Go check out my video, Guadalupe, the Guadalupe woman, the Calavera skull, the Calico man, all this stuff. Like, there's so many finds here. This is just another one. Again, this guy's telling you, you know what we're reading, right? Already told you. The American Antiquarian Oriental Journal, 1903. They didn't tell us about this in school. They just conveniently left this out of our curriculum. Right, that they found under 60 feet in thickness of mud and water, what it seems to be a, a, a flood, a, a mud flood. Right, they found mangled down under with the ruins are human skeletons and the tusk of elephants, humans with elephants, distributed in a way which indicates that the overflow of water and mud was sudden, given no time for escape. The account which has fallen under our notice is somewhat brief. We cannot vouch for its accuracy and simply present the report. All right. This is the report from the, the Mexican archeo leading archaeologist. All right. Portions of anthropologists, you know, everything. You saw all his titles. Portions of buildings so far unearthed show that the city, at least the largest of the cities, were covered by the debris of the flood. There being at least three cities destroyed. Three cities under there was what he's finding. Destroyed was very extensive guys this the indications are that there were many massive structures many massive structures in the falling city again we just talking about buried cities under mexico valley and that they were of a class of architecture not to be found elsewhere in mexico according to the estimates of the scientists under whose directions the excavations are now being made okay scientists not just anybody over there looking for gold or anything like that looters we're talking about real scientists doing real digs excavations the city is questioned in question had a population of at least fifty thousand minimum they're saying the destruction which was brought by the flood by the flood what flood what flood was that was complete all the inhabitants of the cities were killed as well as all the animals skeletons of human inhabitants of the cities and of the animals are strewn all through the debris from a depth of three feet from the surface to a depth of 60 feet guys from three feet to 60 feet all kinds of bones and stuff and, and animals mammoths horses all that come on now Come on now, why they put in this in this report if it was fake? Be logical. What what do you have to say to debunk all this? You're gonna show me monkey bones to debunk all this? What are you showing me like this in the so-called Middle East and so-called Mesopotamia or Africa? What are you showing me like this and so many different spots in a small spot like this in the Valley of Mexico? This is like come on, all these what we've talking about today so far, guys. Other than the California stuff, you know, it's been in Mexico, all these buried cities. So imagine all over the Americas that we actually start digging and all that, you know. But you guys get my point. Again, from three feet to 60 feet below, they're finding human bones and animals, elephants, all that. Showing that all the debris was deposited almost at once, almost at once. It all happened. It seems like there was a major cataclysm. Measurements show that the debris is on average 60 feet deep where the largest of the city stood. Come on, 60 feet, that means there's buildings buried, guys. We're on top of buildings. 
most remarkable of the minor finds that have been made are at Paredon is that of the remains of elephants. Elephants, never before in the history of Mexico has it been ascertained positively that elephants were ever in the service of the ancient inhabitants. But guess what? <laughs> it seems like they were. The remains of the elephants that have been found at Paredon show plainly that the inhabitants of the buried cities made elephants work for them. Hello, can I get a body bag for the illusion? <laughs> yeah. Elephants were as much an evidence in the cities as horses, okay? We had horses. Upon many of the tusks that have been found were rings of silver. Most of the tusks encountered so far have an average length for grown elephants of three feet and an average diameter at the roots of six inches. Judging from the remains of the elephant so far unnerved, the animals were about 10 feet in height and 16 to 18 feet in length, differing very little from those at present existence. Just like the elephants of today, guys. You heard? You hearing? Just like the elephants of today. All right. Now, these statements in reference to the elephants' bones found among the ruined cities need confirmation before they are accepted by the majority of archaeologists. Archaeologists don't want to accept this again. It is true that the tusks and bones of mastodons are frequently found in the swamps of Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana, but they are supposed to belong to the same species which are found in the frozen mud of Siberia and the gravels of the northwest coast. A species covered with hair and adapted to the cold climates. All right, so we're going to show that again today. I already debunked that. We had all kinds of different animals looking just like the ones in Africa and India today. Over here in the Americas. All the way in the Carolinas, Costa Rica, all over the place. I'm going to show you guys. A species covered with hair and adapted to... All right, so the circumpolar regions are full of these creatures. So they're saying, again, it's not supposed to be here. You know, other types of elephants without the hair which have perished, but their bodies have been preserved in the ice beds. Other animals, such as the buffalo and bison, have overrun portions of this continent since the days of the Macedon, but none of them reached as far south as Mexico. <laughs> That's what he thinks. The cities of Mexico. So he's saying, hey, look, Macedon's and all these people are the ones with the hair not supposed to be down there. So these are different types of elephants. The cities of Mexico are supposed to have been built not earlier than 1500 AD. Say what? About 500 years ago. Dodge the hijack. If any were built earlier, they are in ruins. But no remains of elephants have been discovered among the ruins. In fact, no semblance of the elephant has been recognized in the sculpture, except in few cases where what resembles an elephant's trunk or the trunk of a tapir is found on the sculptured columns at Copan. And it actually is an elephant, not a tapir. The discovery of elephant bones would go too would be too important a matter to be ignored too important but the article seems sensational and has been sent to the newspapers as a sensational item it seems and not to the scientific society so far as we have learned the whole subject of the presence of the mastodon on the american continent is discussed in the august and september numbers of the records of the past the arguments which favor a recent date are first the presence of the bones in the peat swamps of ohio and michigan second the drawing on the mercer tablet of an elephant the Mercer tablet attacked by Indians. Third, the figure of an elephant on a pottery pitcher from the cliff dwellings. All these are, however, outside of Mexico, and so prove nothing in reference to this sensational report. All right, so that's because these people didn't know that, you know, they actually they have found a lot of different types of elephants in Mexico, Central America, South America. You know, when they started actually really looking for this stuff, you know. So, I just want to read to you guys this. This made it here. And this was by Nicholas uh, De Leon again. I mean, his credentials speak for himself. Like he's, this is what he's reporting. All right. So when we're talking about elephants, people are like, no, nah, I can't be like, it must be mastodons. But you know, people don't really understand. All right, we're gonna go over. Let me see. Hold on, guys.
So elephants, all right, since we're in the subject of elephants. Came back into contact. ended. gonna uh, take a look at a little bit of this video um, you know some common information most people don't know this article I found here in National Geographic it says here the rights of mammals all right and we're gonna go to a certain part of this article so it says early in the Miocene Africa's long isolation ended when it in Arabia came back into contact with Eurasia that's when the ancestors of many mammals we think of native to Africa arrive, all right? So a lot of animals that you thought were native to Africa, that's when they actually came. They weren't in Africa. Okay. First came the ancestors of the antelope, like cats, giraffes, and rhinos. Later, around 10 million years ago, North American mammals like camels, there you go, camels, horses, and dogs. Almost every animal that roams the Serengeti today is a relative newcomer to the continent it says here the evolution of all right so again <laughs> see how you just threw it in there so you know camel right such a symbol of egypt right africa right egypt that came from america they're telling you right there we proved we proved that camels originated horses dogs and a lot more a lot more evolution of mammals huh mammals so it says the evolution of mammals has passed through many stages since the first appearance of their synapsid ancestors. So the synapsis is basically like the first kind of reptilian uh, mammal-like animal, right? Like in, the, in between they're saying, that's what they're describing. And it says that the ancestors were in the Pennsylvanian sub-period of the late Carboniferous period. All right, so Pennsylvanian, what is that? All right, so Pennsylvania geology, what does that mean? All right, it says the Pennsylvania, also known as the Upper Carboniferous or Late Carboniferous, is the ICS geologic time scale, younger of the two subperiods. All right, so it says it lasted from roughly 323.2 million years ago to 298 million years ago. Very long time, right? As with most, most other geochronologic units, the rock beds that define the Pennsylvanian are well identified. They know what they're talking about and they know what region of the world specifically is what they're gonna tell you. But the exact date of the start and end are uncertain by a few hundreds of thousands of years. The Pennsylvanian is named after US state of Pennsylvania, where the cold productive beds of this age are widespread. All right, it was mainly there. So what happened there again? Mammals first evolved from there, Pennsylvania. We're talking about North America. We're talking about the oldest land out of the water. What does Louis Agassiz tell us? And, and now the Maya also, they, it's in their foundational mythology and history actually, that they are the, the first, you know, out of the water, the Mayak, from the bosom of the water they came up. And if you read the Popol Vuh, has the same story as Genesis the creation story all right so we're talking about the real old world again is the earliest known synopsis remember these are the first uh, reptilian mammal-like animals that lived in the pennsylvania sub here so they know this was in pennsylvania area right there the beds they they got the proof they know it happened 323 between 29 million years ago they say right so supposedly right start evolving right well, that's the story they tell us, right? But what I want to show you is that they're admitting that this happened here. And they called it the Pennsylvania uh, geologic scale or time time scale. You know, again, just have uh, an open mind when I'm reading the rest of the stuff because now you know mammals originated here. Now that you know that, now have some common sense, right? Because we just read, right, in the uh, National Geographic article 
all those mammals that ended up in Africa, right? That weren't even there. So where do you think they're coming from? What, what was the track they took to get there, right? That's what I'm going to show you. And I've shown you before is, for example, like this map right here, right? It's showing um, America and uh, Asia actually connected. The mammals originated in America. So how, how did they get to Asia? You understand what I'm saying? So even though they, they grab and they'll say, well, this animal originated in Asia, they're not going all the way back, right? You're just starting right there. They ha there's a history before that. All right, now we're going to read from this book called Extinct Monsters and Creatures of Other Days, a popular account of some of the larger forms of ancient animal life by Reverend H.N. Hutchinson, B.A., with illustrations by J. Smith, Addison Woodward, it says here, and uh, this is from 1911, it says, uh, American geologists tell us that a long time ago, during the Eocene period, there was a great tropical lake in the Wyoming Territory, on the borders of which roamed amidst luxuriant vegetation and large number of strange and primitive quadrupeds, together with many other forms of life. So all this desert area was lush. It was an Eden, all right? The most wonderful group of animals that haunted the shores of this lake or perhaps river valley was the Dinocerata, so fully described by Professor Marsh in his exhaustive monograph. The name implies that they were terrible horned monsters, but whether nature provided them with true horns, like those of horned cattle today, is at least open to doubt. All right, so it's figure 94, which is this one right here with the skeleton, shows the skeleton of these namely Tynoceras, engines, and length was about 12 feet high without the tail. Its weight went all right. So they're describing how it looks, right? All right. So, so this is Vincent, which was generously presented by Professor Marsh. Looking at the skeleton, one is struck with a certain resemblance to the rhinoceros. Body reminds one more of a rhino, Cirrus. So this is what they're showing right here, what it might have looked like. So they remember they're saying it looks like a, almost like an elephant, uh, rhino. All right, and this is from America. Again, remember America. All right. Because in the country east of the Rocky Mountains, including the states of Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, and part of Colorado, Professor Marsh has discovered the remains of yet another strange group of large quadrupeds. The best known of these is Brontops, of which the skeleton is seen in figure 97. These animals lived after the Dinocerata, namely in the Miocene period, and were the largest American mammals of that period. They constitute a distinct family more nearly allied to the rhinoceros than to any other living form. The skeleton of which figure 97 is found was the most complete of any yet discovered by Professor Marsh. And this is what it looks like, it says here. I know it's a little, you know, but look at it, it's just like a rhino. I mean, look at it. All right, so this is from America. And this is from America. All right. Now, in this same book, Extinct Monsters and Creatures of the Other Days. I was just showing that because, you know, you know, rhinos... Again, mammals coming out of here, so you, we're going to get all of them, right? If the mammals started around this area, you know, in whatever way, it's, you know, they call it evolution, you know, but whatever way it was, they are like, hey, this happened around here. Like, this is, we've got the tracks here, the coal mine, all that stuff is going on right here. So uh, it seems that there was a type of uh, rhino elephant, you know, <laughs> so... But we're going to show you that the uh, ancestors of the elephants, the one that they could, in science, they officially say, yeah, this is the ancestor of elephants. It's found all throughout the Americas. All right, we're in chapter uh, 14. And it says here, the story of the elephants. All right, just want to talk about elephants now. It says, the science of paleontology is always advancing, sometimes by leaps and bounds, at other times slowly but surely. It is our pleasant duty to record here a great step in advance made some seven years ago, chiefly by the researchers in Egypt of Dr. C.W. Andrews, FRS. His discoveries in the district known as the Fayum have enabled him to solve a very important and interesting problem, namely the evolution of the elephant, the only living representative of that strange order known to naturalists and paleontologists as the proboscidea. All right? Now, this is what he's saying though, all right? because they are all provided with trunks because they all have trunks so it must come from him the relationships of the group are still 
partly wrapped in mystery. All right. So it says fossil remains of elephants have, on account of their common occurrence in various parts of the world, attracted a great deal of attention, both from the learned and unlearned. In the north of Europe, they have been found in Ireland, in Germany, in Central Europe, in Poland, Middle and South Russia, Greece, Spain, Italy, also in Africa, and over a large part of Asia. In the New World, they have been found abundantly, abundantly in North America. But in the frozen regions of Siberia, their tusks, teeth, and bones are met with in very great abundance. And we're back in the book Animals of the Past, an account of some of the creatures of the ancient world by Frederick A. Lucas, the director of the American Museum of Natural History. Now it says here, where the Macedons originated, we know not. They don't know. All right. Senora Menguino thinks their ancestors are to be found in Patagonia, and he is very probably wrong. Professor Kopi thought they came from Asia, and he is probably right. So if you don't know, why are you saying he's wrong and he's right, right? Or they may have immigrated from the convenient Antarctica, which is called up to account for various facts in the distribution of animals. Neither do we at present know just how many species of mastodons there may have been in the Western Hemisphere, for most of them are known from scattered teeth, single jaws, and odd bones, so that we cannot tell just what differences may be due to sex or individual variation. It is certain, however, that several distinct kinds of species have inhabited various parts of North America, while remains of others occur in South America. The mastodon, however, the one most recent in point of time and the best known because of its remains, are scattered far and wide over pretty much the length of breadth of the United States and are found also in southern and western Canada, is that on which the law of priority seems to have inflicted the inappropriate name of Mammut Americanum. Right, so they found so many that they gave it its own name and they actually passed it as American. Though the centers who feel that it is better to be true than to be consistent still cling to Mastodon Americanus. And unless otherwise specified, this alone will be meant when the name Mastodon is used. In some localities, the Mastodon seems to have abounded, but between the Hudson and Connecticut rivers, indications of its former presence are rare and east of that are particularly wanting. The best preserved specimens come from Ulster and Orange counties in New York, for these seem to have furnished the animals with the best facilities for getting married. All right, so before I continue, just a couple of examples of some of these uh, so-called, you know, elephants or mastodons, whatever. So this is a scientific name of Cuvia reunius. Uh, it's an extinct New World genus of Gomophoteres. All right. Gomophoteres are any members of the diverse extinct taxonomic family called Confroteridae. Confroteridae were elephant-like proboscidians, but not belonging to the family Elephantidae. All right. So you see. So because they're not, <laughs> and well, they're on that side of the world, they say, oh, but they don't belong to the Elephantidae family. But these are elephants. It's the same thing. These are ancestors. Of the, they were widespread in North America during the Melusine Pleistocene. All right. Just want you to see how they looked. We got a couple of pictures here of renditions. All right. All right. Which was this one. All right. Check it out. All right. says the oldest fossil remains to date are a Kruber species found in Lincoln County, Nebraska, Nevada, which date to an ac accurate 4.6 million years ago. So this was found in Nevada. Check it out. Tell me what's the why tell me why this is not an elephant in the elephant Tadidi family. Right, so now they're classifying them differently. Now that's why you can't find them, or saying that oh they, they, you know, they were never in America. They originated in Africa or Asia. All right, so they're not classifying these as elephants. But look at this. What is the difference? Tell me. It's very minimal. And real quick, just to continue here, it says it was also found this elephant right as far east as South Carolina and North Carolina in Pleistocene rocks dating 1.8 million to 126,000 years ago. In Florida, remains show Corvironius sp and C tropicus. That's two different elephants living from 3.7 to 1.5 millennia ago. The most recent findings of Corvironius in North America are in Sonora, Mexico. That date to 13,390. That's not that far. Then we got Stegomastodon. 
says is an extinct genus of the Gomophoteris. Right, again, a family of proboscideans. Also, now they are a family of the proboscideans. You see that? It is not to be confused with the genus Mammoth for a different proboscidean family. All right. So, just want to show you real quick again. Just a little picture of how they see on here. So, check this out. All right. Is that Utah? Nevada? What is this? Four corner region. Look at this. And you see the horses. See all these elephants. Gophromatidis, whatever you want to call them. They look just like elephants to me. You got Snow Macedon. Look at the site where they found a lot of this stuff. All right. And then it says Discovery. They found a what? A Colombian mammoth. All right. Colombian mammoth is an extinct species of mammoth that inhabit North America as far north as the United States. All right. And as far south as Costa Rica. Wow. So we had these Colombian mammoths here where I live. All right. Uh, it has a different picture here, right, of the Colombian mammoth. Let me show you that. This is the one right here. Look at that. Look at that, what that looks like. That was here in Costa Rica and all over North America. All right. They want you to not think like it was like an elephant, like in Africa, but they're trying to mess with your perspective and your, and your whole logic. Like, just look at this. All right. These originated here in America. All right. Originated here in America. Just a quick reminder because it says here in Animals of the Past. An account of some of the creatures of the ancient world. Remember, this was written by the director of the American Museum of Natural History. Page 149, he says, The mammoth, the exact birthplace of the mammoth, is as uncertain as that of many other great characters. They don't know where the mammoth originated. All right? We have mammoths over here in America. All right? We have a lot of close ancestors that resemble or eventually could have become elephants originating here in America. All right, so they don't know where he was, his birthplace, all right? So again, this is the Colombian mammoth. Again, if they don't know where the Mastodon or the mammoth originated, how can they tell you it doesn't originate in America? That's what I'm, you know, we've been always telling you, all right? So it's just a little bit of uh, here about the elephant. You know, we had an abundance of, we just saw the Father Crespi video, right? Father Crespi showing us all these artifacts he found and many of them had elephants all over it. All right. We find elephants in the Maya codices and the temples. Right. We find elephants all over the place in America. All right. The Lenape also have a depiction of an elephant or mammoth. All right. So, you know, it's just something to think about. I want to talk about now. There are so many different types of uh, ancestors to elephants and different types of elephants, you know. Um, we already know mammals came out of here, had different elef elephants here. I uh, mentioned the uh, Gomophoteres, how abundant they were over here. These are definitely ancestors to all elephants, mammoths, mastodons, and all that. And um, just wanted to show you kind of some, some of these websites here. Where they show the, uh, the pictures. It says South American Gomophoteres. And as you can see, Right, just look at this one. Look at that. Massive. Pretty big. All different types. All right. This going for fossils in South America. They just own these. They were everywhere in South America. There. It says, meet the Gomophoteres. Archaeologists discover bones of elephant ancestors. As an animal once believed to have disappeared from North America before humans ever arrived there, might actually have roamed the continent longer than previously thought. All right, because you know what? They're finding, you know, spears and everything on these uh, bones, and they're finding, you know, doing their radiocarbon and seeing that they're much recent than they thought before. All right, just want to again show you some of these images. Okay. They're all in America. 
many different types of uh, elephants. We saw the Colombian mammoth earlier. All right. So these also looked, some of them, they're drawn with hair, some of them are not. They argue about that. They don't know, you know. They don't know they were showing us the different depictions. All right, like this one, that's what I mean. Again, the Colombian mammoth. This was all the way from North America to all the way Central America and parts of South America. They run Costa Rica, remember? Yeah. Colombian mammoth, you see? Huge, big. Mammoth and mastodons, so different, but they were all here. Look at this. All right, they didn't have fur. They always try to make them look like really different than the uh, modern elephant, so you don't relate. We had huge elephant ancestor uh, animals here in North America. Huge, really big ones, All right? Like they, again, they try to put hair on them sometimes, make them look a little different. So it's here to Utah's San Juan River. Petroglyphs depict mammoths, right? This is in Utah. This is near uh, Upper Sand Island near near Bluff, Utah. This is from some college uh, websites, on EDU, UNL, EDU. It says elephants in Nebraska. <laughs> At different times during the Cenozoic, many types of elephants roamed the Nebraska landscape. Many types, many types, all right? Not just one type, many types of elephants roam Nebraska landscape. Poor Tuskers, Stegomastodons, all right? Pay attention because this is what they'll tell you. You know, elephants and all these other ones from modern come out of these guys. They'll, they'll show you evolutionary charts and they'll put mastodons as the uh, progenitor of everything. Uh, but we already got other ones too, you know. They all were here. Mastodons and mammoths were some of the most common elephants in Nebraska. All right, stickle mastodons, mastodons and mammoths were common. The ancestor of modern elephants. They were all here. They were very common. They originated here. Information on these elephants listed below. Four Tuskers, all right, it says here. It says remains of four Tuskers found in the Ogala La group. They are all this elephant known to exist in Nebraska. All right, stickle mastodons existed in Nebraska. During the playoffs, seeing the position of the Broadwater Formation, they became extinct about four million years ago. It says, according to them, dodge the hijack. They don't know. Okay. And then, again, they say these are the uh, descendants or the ancestors, sorry, but the elephants. They'll show you shards going back to the uh, Stegomastodon, right? They're letting you know. And he was where? Here in America. You see? Well, it's just it's Nebraska. Mastodon, right? They show him woolly hair always. Mastodon from all, a lot of mastodons weren't woolly hair. And a lot of mammals weren't hairy either but you know they always show the typical one some did have here this is says photo of archie from the university of nebraska okay so that's what we're dealing with right now okay so you can see how all different kinds of elephants here just figured from the north american elephant evolution during the Cenozoic era all right elephants elephants all right elephants now remember we had lions right lions elephants horses Horses, dogs, we've proven that already. Again, mammals all originated here, so we got to put our logic together. If mammals originated here, we got all the ancestors of the elephants here, abundantly, right? Abundantly, many types, many types of elephants, abundantly, all right? So it's here, ancient DNA changes everything we know about the evolution of elephants. This is, I thought this was interesting, just real quick. It said, for, long, for a long time, zoologists assumed that there were only two species of elephants, one Asian and one African. Then genetic analysis suggested that the African elephant could be divided into two distinct species, the African forest and African savanna elephants. Now, a new elephant has been added to the mix. The Paleoloc Sodan Antiquus has been extinct for 120,000 years. This elephant roams Europe and Western Asia. Huh? What Asia? Remember what I was showing you, the map connected. That's what I'm saying. A lot of these people will give will, will say that most animals originated in Asia. What Asia? And that's where they end. All right? The farthest east was America. 
says this study changes everything we thought we knew about the evolutionary history and ancestry of modern elephants and their closest relatives. It also shows that the African elephant's lineage was not confined to Africa. It's not just from there. Remember, their mammals just got there. A lot of them came from North America. They admitted that in National Geographic. We got all the ancestors over here. It says here, Sistine Chapel of the Ancients, rock art discovered in remote Amazon forests. It was a very interesting thing they found, uh, you know, recently about last year, I believe, or this year. And um, it says here real quick, their data is based on partly on their depictions of now extinct Ice Age animals, such as the Mastodon, a prehistoric relative to the elephant that has roamed South America for at least 12,000 years. There's also images of Paleo Lama and extinct Camelid, all right, Camel as well as giant sloths and Ice Age horses. All those animals originated here in America. Again, elephants and the rock art, all right? Depict giant ice age creatures, all right? Amazon rainforest rocks depict giant ice age creatures. Creatures they call them, all right? Again, mastodons and elephants. This here, Pennsylvania's elephant petroglyph on the Allegheny River. All right, so look into that. Again, it's called Pennsylvania's elephant petroglyph in the Allegheny River. This here, Encyclopedia of Cryptozoology. The American elephant was a cryptid reported historically from the United States and Canada, mainly from New England, Great Lakes region, and the Rocky Mountains. All right, New England, animals resembling elephants were mentioned in the stories of a variety of Amerindian groups, particularly in the East. Although the animals were usually said to have vanished at some point in the past, Living elephants were occasionally reported from a rumor to exist in the American interior in the 16th to 19th century. You heard that? That's from the okay, okay, reported elephants reported. <laughs> they had elephants here. It actually keeps going, guys. Uh, this video, uh, we actually saw a lot of it, but this is again my uh elephant video, uh, you know, proven. Uh, it's this one right here. This is the cover that all the ancestors that they're saying. That the elephants in Africa descend from, uh, they found all those ancestors and many other different types of elephants here in North America, and there is no evidence or anything suggesting that those these animals they found here came from Asia. In fact, most of the animals they're actually finding out are coming out of here, going into Asia. We've done the studies, especially with the camels and horses. They can't deny that. All right. Hey, shout out to the real ones in the chat. I appreciate everybody that's here. All right, let's get some music going. Hold on. Oh, 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 oh. Right on time, y'all. Right on time. Came right on time. Uh, <laughs> 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 Hey yo, hey yo, hey yo. Hey, what's up? What's up? What's up, family? Primos. <laughs> what up, cuz? Hey, um, we're gonna get into this book real quick. I shared this on my Patreon, in case you wanna, in case you don't know yet. <laughs> uh this is where I read a lot of the Quiquilco stuff, but I obviously I read other sources. But there's a lot of good info here about America. Uh, it says here, Ancient Man, A Handbook of Puzzling Artifacts by William R. Corliss. Okay. Let's see here. All right. We're going to go to page 465. And it says here, Elephants in America? Hold on. Get back. Not so with me. Okay. No, it's gonna hate. We're gonna leave it like that. So, elephants in America, huh? Says here the Moab Mastodon pictograph, anonymous Scientific Monthly, volume forty-one. So, rock carvings, variously known as pictographs or petroglyphs, are familiar features to persons who have worked in the canyon-cut country of the Southwest. 
that they have not excited greater interest is perhaps due to the fact that they commonly portray such things as aboriginal man was doubtless familiar with goats serpents human figures and fowls make up most of those i have personally examined in 1924 however i was informed by john bristol of moab utah the real moab yeah moab in utah that there was what he believed to be a mastodon pictograph some three miles down the Colorado Canyon from what that village. Though this excited my interest, the search had to wait for 10 years until I was again in that vicinity last summer. In August of last year, Denise uh, Baldwin, Fred Strong Jr. and I, after considerable searching, found the desired pictograph. That this carbon designed to be an elephant or mastodon is evident. It represents a good deal of work on the part of the primitive artist for the figure from the end of his very pachydermous tail to the tip of his trunk is almost two feet long and appears to have been made by painstaking method of chipping uh, the whole figure from the solid rock while with a blunt pick, chisel, or similar tool. It is a recessed or etched figure composed of closely shaped pock marks. All right, so that's one. Again, so we're just corroborating. Like I show a lot of this on the other video I was just at, guys. So if you haven't watched that video, this is some newer stuff that I didn't go over. Uh, that's in this book. I want to uh, give a shout out to James. Hey, I saw your brother come in. Thanks for the donation. Appreciate you, brother. Much love. And I got you. Got you for that. All right. Shout out to uh, Randy Purcell. Thank you very much, brother. Appreciate it. All right. Let's hear the Lenape Stone from uh, Richard Green, Niara Newsletter. A century ago in the spring of 1872, a farm boy plowing in the fields near Dolston, Pennsylvania, allegedly discovered an unusual stone. It seemed to be the larger section of a broken gorget stone or pendant with two holes through it for inserting thong to hang it about one's neck. The finder, Bernard Hansel, noted that the stone was carved on one side with an assortment of pictographs and on the other with the form of an animal resembling an elephant. Hansel kept the stone in his pocket for several days and later stored it with other artifacts he had found about the farm. He kept in mind the place where he had found the stone and occasionally searched for the missing half. Nine years later, 1881, Hansel sold his entire collection of artifacts to the one Henry Paxson of Dolston for $2.50. The sale brought the carved stone to light and it soon became a topic of wine widening interest. Hansel redoubled efforts to find the missing piece of stone and was indeed successful several months after the sale. Hansel then gave the second part of the stone to Paxton free of charge, and the combination of the piece produced a scene which could only be interpreted as a pictographic account of an Indian encountered with a mammoth. Hmm. An Indian with a mammoth, or an elephant. Remember, they're using mammoth, but a lot of times they didn't look like the woolly mammoths. They looked like regular elephants. All right, so here you go. So if you just joined us, guys, earlier, we had some great information on some buried cities in Mexico. They found one with elephant bones uh, showing that the humans in that city, and this is 60 feet below, from 3 feet to 60 feet below, showing a flood and mud flood, that these humans were living with uh, and using elephants, just like horses. So that's why we're going over the information. The elephants were already here. Elephants, many, many uh, types of different elephants. The ancestors of all modern elephants are found all over the Americas. The bones are all here. The Lenape Stone, as it came to be called after a local branch of the Delaware Indians, produced a storm of controversy, which was well documented by Henry C. Mercer in his book, The Lenape Stone, or Indian, and the Mammoth. J.G. Putnam's sons, 1885, Mercer was a local antiquarian and was to become the leading figure in the Bucks County Historical Society. His reputation as a researcher is well established today for his studies on uh, the colonial fireback. The Bible and iron, the ancient carpenter's tool, the standard work in this field, all right, and so on and so on. So they're talking about the Delapi stone, huh? Okay, so it says in his study unfolds, Mercer brings in every possible source to suggest the late survival of the mammoth. First, he exhibits Mayan architecture designs, which suggest the trunk and facial features of the animal. He goes on to cite the carved stone elephant pipes. The two calumets from Louise County. All right, so we went over the elephant pipes from they found in the mounds as well. Iowa and the elephant effigy mount of Grant County. And there's even an effigy mount in Wisconsin, all right? As for the indications of Indian knowledge of such an animal, the elephant mount is discussed in the Smithsonian Report, 1872, page 416. 
these last items, unfortunately, have not themselves been wholly free of controversy. All right. Moving on. It says here, early man at Holy Oak, Delaware. Uh, John C. and Thomas uh, Kraft. It says here, Science, Volume 192. A re a reevaluation re of the association of early man in northern Delaware with the woolly mammoth. Mammutis or elephants, or an elephant, suggests a time from the early to middle Holocene epoch, 8,000 to 4,000 BC, all right? When we're talking about 8,000 BC, that's over 10,000 years ago, guys. Or alternatively, an extremely early association in the early Wisconsin and late Sagamon's ages. Strat stratigraphic and paleognological analysis identified thin sedimentary layers as representing paleo environments of the late Holocene epoch and early Wisconsin and Sagamon ages in the northern Delaware region at the boundary between the Piedmont and coastal plain geomorphic provinces. These sediments are closely associated with occurrences of abundant archaic and paleo-Indian artifacts and a carving of the woolly mammoth and even a drawing, huh? Below, we discuss the probability of association of these artifacts of early American man with the woolly mammoth as well as with the Mastodon and either the early to middle Holocene epoch, 5,000 to 10,000 years ago. And very latest Wisconsin age or early Wisconsin and late Sagamon age, 60,000 and 100,000 years ago. The Holy Oak Pendant, an interesting discovery pertaining to early man in the New World, occurred in 1864, right? So this this goes right very good with what we're talking about today. When we're talking about early man. We talked about Calavera's skull earlier, right? The uh, Guadalupe woman, the Calico man. Uh, we saw that site had human bones with um, elephants. All kinds of stuff they're finding, you know, all over the place here. So this, you know, another one here. Uh, showing early man in America. Among the items found was a pendant card from a fossil whelk shell into which was incised the image of a woolly mammoth. Needless to say, great excitement ensued concerning this evidence of early American man. Unfortunately, the story of the exact location of discovery of the pendant is somewhat in doubt. One report stated that it was found amidst some peat being dug from a deep hole on the Delaware River plain. The holy oak pendant carved on the surface of a large uh, whelk. This is it right here. So it was found, some say, in the Delaware River Plain, opposite the holy oak station of the Pennsylvania Railroad. The farmers are said to have been digging peat for use as fertilizer. Another account reports that the holy oak pendant was found amidst some peat already spread on a farmer's field near the holy oak station of the Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad. The peat was said to have been taken from a fallen forest layer in one of the adjoining estuaries of the Delaware River. Okay. So, a lot on this as well. It keeps going. The information on it. You guys can see. Make sure to check out the book. Uh, for the patrons, it's on the Patreon. If you guys want to read the whole uh, report on this item. Okay, so actually it's pretty good. A lot of uh, things they can't debunk. They just try to uh, bury Say, oh no, somebody must have buried it there. Oh, you guys are weren't there in the excavation. Somebody uh, implanted it. All right, so it says here the elephant pipe by R.J. Farquharson, American Antiquarian, Volume 2. By a letter from Mr. Peter Mayer, the original finder, now living in Kansas, we learned that he found this elephant pipe six or seven years ago, 1872 or 73, while planting corn on his farm, where he resided in Louisa County, Iowa. The man from whom he obtained it, the brother-in-law of Mari, was under the impression that it was found in Muscatine County, and it was so stated in the first published account. Mr. Mari kept the pipe until he moved to Kansas in 1878, and then he gave it to his brother-in-law, from whom he, we obtained it. The Reverend Mr. Gass, having indirectly heard last winter of the existence of such a relic, sought out the owner and endeavored to purchase it, but in vain. He, however, succeeded in borrowing it for the purpose of taking casts and photographs. While being copied in plaster, it was accidentally broken, and then by comp compromising the matter with the owner and paying him about $5, we obtained the ownership. The finder, Mr. Murray, an illiterate German farmer, had no appreciation of any scientific value or special interest attached to his pipe. He wanted and got nothing for it. Regarding it merely as a curiosity, he found various other Indian stones, as he called them, 
but all these were lost in moving about. The ancient mounds are very abundant in that region, Louisa County, and also very rich in relics. And it is a significant fact that in exploring a considerable number of them, we found that in their construction, no excavation had been made, but that the bodies and relics had been deposited on the original surface of the ground and the mound raised by bringing the earth apparently from the immediate vicinity. In such a case, it would not be strange if in a mound gradually removed by long cultivation, the relics so deposited should at last be reached and turned up by the plow. The material of the pipe is a soft, fragile sandstone. This was not detected until the fracture showed its true nature. A dark external polish, apparently the result of use, misleading us at first. The weight of the pipe is 164 grams. The accompanying woodcut gives us a tolerably good representation of the figure of the animal, but unfortunately the engraver has failed to reproduce the pointed projecting lower lip and the elephant feature will mark in the original. All right, elephant. Not no tapir, not no parrot. All right, that means people saw and lived with elephants. That's a big one, guys. I know it's people that wasn't supposed to significant, it's just a pipe. Well, they saw elephants. People weren't supposed to be with, you know, these type of people, right? Not the mound builders. Hello. Mound builders had elephants. Okay. <laughs> Period. So that's the dimensions, right? That's the image right there, so you guys can see. I actually talk about it more in depth in my ancestor uh, uh, elephant video. So make sure to check that out. Okay, and it says here the play is the Pleistocene carved bone from Hekikwayak, Mexico, a reappraisal. So another bone that's being marked with an elephant. You know, it's it's a pattern going on here that they're leaving these bones marked with elephants. Like, why were they drawing so many elephants? And if we're finding them, that means there was a lot because the ones we find are you know like rare. A carved sacrum from a fossil. Hamlet was found near Tequisquac, so on, on, on a camel bone <laughs> in America, right? In Mexico, a camel bone, right? They found in 1870 in the upper Pleistocene deposits of the Valley of Mexico. At that time, it was described as one of the first discoveries that proved the coexistence of man with extinct fauna in the New World, okay? It proved it. So many findings, guys. How many have I shown you already? The specimen was apparently lost at the end of the 19th century, and serious doubts have been expressed about its authenticity. This carved bone was rediscovered in 1956, and recent studies of the specimen tend to demonstrate its authenticity and scientific value. A survey of all known examples of similar finds in North America suggests that the Hekikskiak bone is probably the only example of true art. That has yet been found in paleo indian levels in the new world all right but remember we talked about uh earlier what they found in cuello talco right two hundred fifty thousand years old they found a bone there as well with also a, a gomosphere one of the ancestors of the elephant so even older type of animal drawn on bone right there in mexico as well all right moving on it says pre-columbian representations of the elephant in america more than 60 years ago, in his incidents of travels in Central America, Stevens directed attention to an elaborately carved idol at Copan and stated that the two ornaments at the top look like the trunks of elephants, an animal unknown in that country. All right, here you go. It's an elephant, not a tapir. It's not a tapir, guys. All right, so elephants with the Mayas and elephants with the mound builders. Okay. No one who knows that the accompanying tracing, which I have taken from Dr. A.P. Mosley's Magnificent Atlas of photog Photographs and Drawings from Central American Monuments, right, that's, he drew it from a source, should have any doubt about the justification for Stephen's comment. Moreover, all right, you gotta be logical. Don't, 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 don't play cognitive dissonance. All right, use your eyes. That's an elephant. Nobody, he, you know, so Stevens was right. He said, hey, I think it looks like an animal. Moreover, the outline of the head is so accurately drawn as to enable the zoologist to identify the original model for the design as the Indian species of elephant. All right. It is equally clear that the sculptor of the monument was not familiar with the actual animal. For according to Dr. Mosley or Seller, he has mistaken the eye for the nostril and the authority meters for the eye and represented the tusk, note in relation to the lower lips and the ventral surface of the trunk in conventional manner. All right, according to what they're saying, right? 
So having converted the auditory meters into an eye, the sculptor had to deal with the auditory pina, the meaning of which do not doubt was a puzzle to him. He resolved these difficulties by converting it into a geometrical pattern, which, however, he was careful to restrict to the area occupied by the relatively small pina that is distinctly of the Indian species of elephant. In the representation of elephants on a beautiful Chinese vase of the Ming period, now in the Victoria and Albert Museum, the posterior border, the pina is lobulated and suggests a transition to the geometrical pattern of the Copan design. The designer also lost his bearing when he came to deal with the turban rider of the elephant. No doubt in the original model, the rider's leg was obscured by the pina, but in the Copan sculpture, he lost his trunk also. So they're saying they, they must have copied from somewhere, but you know, it's kind of showing that's their interpretation of what they're seeing, but clearly an elephant, as you guys see, and the uh, it keeps going. Uh, the report uh, talking about the elephant, all right? So no, hold on, let me see. In these structures, definite as their features are, we are the only representations of elephants in pre-Columbian America. One might perhaps be justified in adopting an attitude of reserve as to their significance, but they do not stand alone. Another most remarkable and unmistakable example appear as headdress in a bas relief at Palenque. I see Bancroft's native races of the Pacific States of North America. Volume uh, 4. Another is a highly conventionalized representation of an elephant's trunk, which appears as a projecting ornament on the Casa del Gobernador at Uxmal. Equally remarkable instances, the use of the elephant as a design in these cases, the whole creature will be found in the so-called Elephant Mound of Wisconsin and the Elephant Pipes of Iowa. All right. Pipes more says the use of the elephant design in these different ways becomes more intelligible when it is recalled that in India and Eastern Asia, the elephant was frequently represented on temples and dagobas and special sanctity became attached to it in religious architecture. Some of the earliest sculptured representations of the elephants in India, going back to the Asokan period, the ancient Nagas, right? Who's the Nagas? The Maya, Maya are found to have the tusk and the ventral surface of the trunk exposed in precisely the same way as the Copan elephants. 36 years ago, Sir Edward T Tyler proved that the pre-Columbian Mexicans had acquired the Hindu game called Pachisi. All right, he's seen it in reverse. 15 years later, the same distinguished anthropologist directed attention to the fact that the Mexican scribes had represented in their Aztec picture writing the Vatican Code is a series of scenes taken from Japanese Buddhist temples scrolls. Again, seen in reverse, touch the hijack. If this is admitted and the facts are much too definite and precise to be denied, the last reason disappears for refusing to admit the identification of the Copanes as elephants. All right, elephants all over the America. Says here, remarkable ancient sculptures from Northwest America by Alfred R. Wallace. In nature, volume 43. All right, what do we got here? Let's see. We got elephants here, too. I haven't read this guy, so. Uh, oh, much smaller than in the title. Whoa, 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 title is Paris Sun Star. Let's read this Ancient Sculptures. So a number of heads were so strongly resembled those of apes that the likeness at once suggested itself. So yeah, we had monkeys here. So that's a whole other thing here. Let me see. We're done with the... Uh... Okay. So we're done with the uh, elephant part here. Oh, one second. But again, we're going to get into a lot of that stuff in that book. I've, uh, I, You know, I read from different books, a lot different chapters and different videos that like we don't stop reading. You know, we try to read all the good stuff here and there and get different opinions from different books, different sources, different topics to correlate what we're proving, right? Like, you know, this is the true old world, America. I hope you guys noticed that today. I hope you guys see even more information. You know, that finding there in, uh, in the Aquahija and Paredon, Mexico, you know, 60 feet below. That was brushed on that nobody really reported after that. You know, that that would have that would have debunked and, and rewrote history. So of course they had to bury that. 
you know, but you got evidence of floods here, mud floods, you know, cataclysms. We're talking about old ages. We're talking about cities, buried cities. Make sure you catch the beginning of the video today. I don't want to make the video too long. Just in case, so people can actually sit and watch something that's already going on. Uh, let me see. Yeah, almost two hours now. Yeah, two hours. So that's a good time to stop. But uh, hope you guys enjoyed uh, the presentation and what I was trying to point out. Again, I'm doing a lot of refreshers for a lot of the new people. I get a lot of new people, guys, that ask me a lot of things. And a lot of these topics are so important to just, like, see at once or not really think about. We have so much proof. How much do we have to show that this is a true old world again mammals originated from here you know catch up on the uh presentations we got the uh, beginning of architecture agriculture all that here the oldest land coming out of the waters the oldest fossils in canada the oldest water all that over here all that over here we feed the world we feed the world the food all the resources minerals gold a lot of that stuff from here a true terrestrial paradise, a true Eden, not a desert over there it has nothing. They haven't found any of the archaeological stuff, nothing. They've, they've admitted that's not the true holy land over there. They've admitted the only thing they got to prove their out of Africa theories, guys, is monkey bones. All right, monkey bones. That's it. That's it. And that's the facts. So you got to believe in evolution and Darwinism for all that. But uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for uh, tuning in. I actually might go live again. I have uh, some info I wanted to go over. You know, old info that was in Spanish. I want to translate it and uh, for the new people as well. All right. I appreciate everybody. I I'm glad you guys enjoy it. I appreciate you guys too. Um, and yeah, let me uh, see if I have time to gather up some more info and go live later. Uh, you know, so what? You know, I, you know, I love doing this. And again, we got so much to talk about always. I, I like hanging out with you guys. Thanks for uh, hanging out with me and hearing me read and all that. I appreciate it. Pura vida, mi gente. Much love and respect. Much love and respect. Wow, wow.